Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Hinge Points. I'm Denny Bessner here, as always, with Matt Chrisman. Uh, we're going to explore in this one uh, one of the most important hinge points in modern history, and probably one of the most important hinge points in the history of the left, and that is the failure of the uh, German revolutions of 1918, 1919, uh, to take off in a way that would have begun some type of genuine socialist or communist European republic. Like, Matt, why do you think this is such an important issue? Uh, I Because uh, the, the subsequent events show uh, that the, uh, the socialist movement, uh, the European-wide socialist movement, never really recovered uh, from this failure. Uh, that the model uh, of uh, socialism in one country that emerged out of the Soviet Union in response to the failure of a European revolution to catch on uh, was always uh, doomed. And while I don't think there's any point in condemning the Bolsheviks and the, and the Communist Party of Russia for the decisions they made, and it, given the, the constraints they were under, uh, their, their improvisations were uh, all being done in the aftermath of a, a catastrophic defeat that uh, for obvious reasons uh people were not uh too excited to, to accept uh because you know you still have to live you still have to uh struggle and and it was it's always worthy to continue struggling but the context of struggle after the failure uh of the german revolution and and the consolidation of capitalist power in europe and, and the beginning of a state competition basically between a uh a communist Russia uh, and a unified uh, capitalism throughout uh, the rest of Europe and the United States was, I mean, we saw what, what it led to. We saw the failure of that model to export meaningful coordinated uh, revolutionary movements outside of uh, the Soviet Union to support them meaningfully. I mean, the, the Spanish Civil War is a good example of that. Uh, and looking back, especially with the knowledge that the uh, October Revolution was started with the specific objective of, of kicking off a uh, European-wide revolution, uh, that clearly the failure for one to occur, in a, in a really meaningful sense, doomed the greatest possibility we had, the, 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 the historical opening that was predicted by Marx. Now, now we're living sort of in this new world that Marx could not have predicted because it uh, involved conditions that he could not have foreseen. He foresaw a continent-wide crisis of capitalism, which you saw in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and we did not get uh, a socialist revolution sweeping the, through the, those areas. And the place that that all started to fall apart uh, was in Germany. Right. And I think it's important what you said to underline is that in a real way, I think the history of the left um, moved in a different direction after the failure of the 1819 revolutions. We're really living in that hangover. And a good way to understand it is that these revolutions and their failure, and particularly as we'll see, uh, the majority socialists, you know, um, the, the centrist or right wing socialists' willingness to essentially compromise with bourgeois capital. Um, laid the foundations for the consolidation of the North Atlantic capitalist world, which would eventually rise to total dominance uh, with at the hands of the American empire uh, after 1945, a genuine global dominance of the likes that the world has never seen. So that capitalism in a real way has taken over the world that there really is today in, in, the, in the United States of 2021 and the globe of 2021, no genuine alternative. And I think uh, and we think that this really um, was pushed on this path-dependent um, journey with the failure of these revolutions. So why don't we go back and just provide a context for the revolution? Because I think a lot of people, particularly on, on the online left, are kind of fantasists about the possibility of revolution, and they constantly talk about it happening. And it's, I think, important to understand what types of conditions um, actually lead to revolution. Unser Blut ist nicht ruhig. Unser Blut so it's late September 1918, and basically the German high command, the German military, recognizes that the war was militarily lost. And actually, it's General Erich Ludendorff, who people might recognize from his later associations with a famous man named Adolf Hitler, 
who decided that there needed to be domestic transformations in German society uh, and essentially that there needed to be some form of democratic government in Germany uh, so that Germany would be able to negotiate with Woodrow Wilson in, in a way that wouldn't, you know, totally destroy uh, the country. So that's sort of the geopolitical conditions. And within Germany itself, and this is really critical, the war had raised expectations that there actually needed to be more democracy within the country itself because World War I uh, was, in my opinion, and there are antecedents, but it's really the first total war. It's really the first war where all of society is mobilized in order to fight this world-ending conflict. Yes, and that process of total mobilization brings with it, as you said, expectations of democratic control of governance. War traditionally has been the chief agent of mobilizing state capacity, uh, and like with most wars, the World War One, even as it was being massively destroying, was also building this uh, capacity for state coordination. And the suggestion there uh, is always, if we can do this in war conditions, maybe we can do it in peace conditions. Maybe we can have a, a national uh, social uh, basis for our economic planning uh, instead of a uh, individuated capitalist one. And so you see throughout the war a ratcheting up of demands for uh, democracy, especially in the context of a um, monarchy. And it really is pretty brilliant of the high command guys like Ludendorff to, uh, it, with one hand, accede to the democratic impulse and at the other, uh, pin a scapegoat for the uh, failure of the war that does not encompass them, the military leadership and the capitalist classes that they represent. Yeah, so one of the most important things that people like Ludendorff are thinking toward the end of World War One is that they want the military, which they kind of understand the war is lost, that it's going to be very difficult for Germany to, to win this thing. They nonetheless want the military to remain and retain its hold on German society. You have this civil peace during World War One. military discipline continues to define German life, and people like Ludendorff basically want to save the honor of the German military so that when the war ends, it's still able to uh, exert significant control on uh, control on German society. And that is, in fact, what happens, even though uh, the Versailles Treaty really does restrict uh, the German military to the famous 100,000 uh, uh, man uh, army. Uh, the military is still uh, seen with significant honor in German society. People view it as one of the most important social institutions. And it, of course, becomes a foundational cultural thing with Nazism, uh, especially uh, further on, both with the fact that a lot of World War I veterans literally comprise the early Nazi movement, uh, and also the fact that that the Nazis are considered to be an insignificant alliance with the military, even though Hitler winds up dominating the military in very significant ways as the 1930s go on. But as Matt was saying, um, you really see significant moves toward democracy in, in 1918, and particularly in January 19, in which you have this huge strike in Germany, in which uh, it's the famous munitions strike, in which workers begin to demand peace and other domestic democratizing reforms. And this is really critical because it's in this uh, munitions uh, strike that the centers of advocacy become so-called Arbeiterräte, or workers' councils. And these were councils that were centered in factories that begin to exert significant political influence, not only on industrial management, but within Germany itself. And so you have this alternative form of political organization that's not parliaments, that's not, you know, bourgeois uh, constitutional monarchy, but is in fact workers' councils. Which you did not have at the start of the war, uh, and which was one of those things that uh, inhibited the, the socialists from uh, resisting the war demands, because they, they were a parliamentary uh, animal at that point. But yes, the, the, the process of fighting the war had not only uh, done a, a significant job to disillusion a lot of German workers from the prerogatives of the empire, uh, but also to give them direct experience of democratic control of their workplace that they hadn't had before. Uh, and, and with that, a greater confidence that they could assert democratic control of an economy. And I know we talk about lived experience as in sort of like a, 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 a funny way sometimes, but in this real way, you could see how the lived experience of war actually needs to new forms of political organization. It's a type of experience that you can't get just through discussion. You actually have to live these sorts of social relations in a meaningful way in order to develop, to develop novel forms of political organization. And that's exactly what happens in Germany, particularly as the war 
you know, grinds on and on and on. And it's pretty clear by 1918 that Germany is not going to win. So what happens in October 1918, uh, the liberal German Prince Max von Baden uh, was appointed Chancellor of Germany. And for the first time in German history, social democratic ministers become part of the German cabinet. And this is really critical because this is where the left begins to to split in a significant way. We talked uh, on the last episode about the, um, the creation of the independent socialists in 1917. But once the social democratic members of the majority socialist party become part of the German cabinet, you really get, you know, they become aligned with what is clearly a a bourgeois state. Um, Nevertheless, throughout this period, the military continues to dominate German society. And most importantly, there are food shortages throughout the country. And I think this is really critical because there's a lot of talk about revolution, sort of like the online world and and even in the off online world. But It's the material depredations of actual wartime experience that engender a revolutionary consciousness, literal food shortages. You are not getting enough to eat that makes people willing to take novel political action. Because you have to be in a position where the risk you are taking by by opposing the state and by mobilizing uh, uh, militantly against it uh, can be weighed against the, uh, the risk of not doing that, the risk of continued immiseration, the risk of continued food shortages, the risk of continual falling. Uh, and what we have not had in, in the United States, certainly uh, for most of its post-war history, is any, any belief that, uh, that, that our lives will be materially, fundamentally made uh, a better, by, uh, better than we can imagine it in our current moment, because we have... Uh, access to surplus at all times we we have food uh and of course there is poverty in america there is hunger in america but it is uh a sustained sort of grinding existence for an immiserated and depoliticized population the the center mass of americans have never experienced uh a situation where the system as it exists is in danger of no longer providing them with basic necessities and that is a the situation you need to have for people to take the leap into the darkness uh, of uh, revolutionary action on a mass scale. Cheap food is so important to the maintenance of the status quo. I just want to underline that. It's so important, those basic material necessities. Once they are met, it's very difficult to have radical political action. Yes. So what's happening, it's late October, the war's winding down, and the German Navy, in, in, in an insane gambit, particularly in retrospect, they decide that they're going to try to attack the British Royal Navy uh, basically, so that they'll be able to re-engender some sort of fighting spirit in, in the in the German uh, in the German Navy, of course, at first, but also throughout German society, things are, are coming apart at the seams throughout the autumn of 1918, and the and the answer of the German Navy is to attack the British. It's a it's a Junker uh, kamikaze attack, basically. Exactly. The the, the the aristocratic ruler leaders of the navy uh, not able to handle. Uh, a world where they have been defeated uh, would rather go out in a blaze of glory and be be written in history as as uh, heroes. But uh, you know, if you're a stiff necked junker freak in a in an, in an admiral's uniform, that makes sense. If you're a, if you're a bosun's mate or a midshipman uh, who's being asked to be annihilated and turned into shark bait in the North Atlantic for no reason, uh, it's a different question. Exactly, and I think that's also a big difference between the military ruling classes of, of something like late imperial Germany and the modern United States. Are these are people who who saw valor and sacrifice and romanticism in war, and that is just not the case any longer. And that's probably something we'll return to throughout the show. But these people really thought that they were going to be written in history that they'll literally go to the halls of Valhalla, sometimes literally, sometimes not literally, uh, and, and and be honored for their sacrifice. And I don't think that really exists any longer. No. I mean, there is a lot of uh, self-pathology and, and, and uh, yes. smoke smoke blowing in the military about its honor and duty. But at the end of the day, it's a job. Right. It's, it's a, a it's profession. A, it's a profession. Uh, and that and that attitude permeates the entire organization especially at the top i mean the the people who are selected for uh leadership of the modern american military are peter principal uh, middle managers because they're not asked to uh go out into the field and uh die uh for the glory of the country they're asked to manage imperial conflicts eternally with no uh actual uh, goal of victory uh and in fact any insistence on uh 
resisting the conventional wisdom of whatever engagement they're involved in is met with uh, punishment. The, 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 what the system now selects for is people who will always tell their superiors what they want to hear, which hollows out any real commitment to anything beyond one's own, as with everyone else in America and as everything else in capitalism, it slowly uh, bores its way through all human relations. It replaces every other consideration with personal advancement within the system and, and rationalization people, and, uh, a rational matrix of uh, of decision making and that system of selection has now filled our entire ruling class at every level with just hollow vessels of personal ambition uh and that means that you don't have that uh that romantic stormy uh apocalyptic uh verve within uh, any of our ruling classes. Right, and in some sense, these these German military leaders really didn't want to live through the war. They, they imagined themselves as sort of Frederick Barbarossa storming across the fields of Europe, and, and, and they thought they were going to die in this big conflagration. But as Matt just said, if you're a, you know, a, st- a, 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 normal, a normal sailor, you're maybe less willing to do this, and that's in fact what's happened. First in Wilhelmshaven, and then in Kiel, and particularly Kiel is important, a bunch of sailors actually refused to obey this suicide mission, this lost war mission, this kamikaze mission that they knew wasn't going to succeed. Yeah, and th- that is uh, very similar to what you see in the Soviet Union uh, or in Russia, the Russian Empire a year earlier. Is, exactly. is, is the revolution beginning with the refusal of soldiers to uh, carry out uh, self-destructive uh, orders on behalf of this uh, totally alien, uh, aristocratic military ruling class. And so that's also, again, another thing to point to that really differentiates the modern uh, United States from these sorts of societies, where there was a mass of soldiers who were actually who actually had combat experience and were actually willing to put their lives on the line. And I think that that just doesn't exist in the modern United States. And again, why I find the talks of a coup of January 6th kind of absurd is because there is no mass of people willing to put themselves on the line to sacrifice sacrifice their lives for that type of political people, action. People won't even sacrifice a paycheck. And it's right. understandable for them not to because there is nothing else to believe in but the self and the self and self advancement. And so what happens in this revolution, this sort of great refusal that happens at Wilhelmshaven and Kiel, uh, is that the the military authorities actually respond to it with violence, and they actually wind up killing several mutineers. Uh, but nevertheless, this moment is crucial because the mutineers begin to call for the creation of a republic. And this call for the creation of a republic inspires uprisings first throughout northern Germany, uh, particularly German port cities, and most importantly in Hamburg, which was Germany's second largest city, but also in Bavaria in Munich and also in Frankfurt on Main. And in all of those cities, local radicals actually take advantage of the, de- uh, the declining conditions of German society to spur a revolution that eventually even spreads to Berlin, the German capital. And when it spreads to Berlin, uh, Prince Max von Baden, who again had been appointed you know, the liberal uh, leader of Germany um, in, in October 1918, sees which ways the winds were blowing, <laughs> declares uh, that the Kaiser has abdicated and actually gives his office to the socialist Friedrich Ebert, who is the head of the majority socialist political party. And this is really critical because what you have right now is the majority socialists put in charge of a revolutionary moment. And this is really critical. This is a hinge point. And in fact, within days, uh, the Ebert government passes a number of reforms. Uh, Most importantly, he restores civil liberties, and he also institutionalizes the eight-hour workday. And at the same time he's doing this, he is mobilizing the forces of the state to repress the revolutionary uh, masses wherever they are. He sends Gustav Noski to Kiel to, uh, to... essentially commandeer the mutiny there uh, he's greeted as uh, as a hero by by the sailors because they recognize him as a socialist as, as a fellow uh, commoner but then he quickly is able to reassert control uh, by the officers there uh, and and that process uh, is carried out uh, throughout the country where now with uh, government control the uh, as you the SDP goes about uh, using it to uh, to defend, in a, in a real sense, defend capitalism and to defend the state. And in particular, what Ebert and, and Noska really fear 
is the councils. They 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 fear it because essentially you, you have a disagreement between parliamentary governance and more organic uh, industrial-based workers' councils. And so they begin to make arguments that the councils are actually importations from Russia, that they're non-German, that the true socialists all recognize that you're going to need uh, to, to work through parliament. And in so doing, they actually reject these uh, councils, which by late eight, 1918 and early 1919 begin to be comprised of primarily workers and returning soldiers. By February 1919, most of the German army is demobilized. And so you have the return of a lot of soldiers and many of them actually join the uh, these councils. And so you have a disagreement between social majority socialists who want to maintain parliamentary control and basically run the state from the top, uh, as, as Matt gestured to, in, in line with essentially reactionary forces, both of the radical right we'll see with the Fry Corps, but also with... Um, bourgeois capital, uh, and they're rejecting these sorts of organic councils that begin because, you know, throughout Germany, they begin to actually have governing functions. That is, the councils begin to actually exert governing functions. And this is happening throughout late 1918. And this is where you see the uh, the truly poisonous effect of uh, the legitimization of the Social Democratic Party, because uh, as much as there might have been anxiety about foreign importation and, uh, and tyranny or whatever was the uh, stated objection of the uh, SDP leaders, at the end of the day, they were protecting their positions. They were protecting their positions within a parliamentary party that held commanding heights of a po power within the, uh, the election, electoral apparatus and labor unions. They were There was no place for them in a uh, movement that was being actually... Uh, functionally commanded through democratic uh, assemblies within uh, uh, military units and uh, and factories. And so once again, you see the triumph of nationalism over socialism. And you see the power of a nationally organized political party uh, to put down more organic movements, uh, just like similar to what happened in 1914 when the socialists voted in favor of war credits. You see this idea that the only way that that capitalism is going to be transcended is through the government of uh, the governance, the governing of a national political party. And this is the idea that Ebert and Nasca take with them to the heights of power. And this is one of the reasons they begin to fear the workers movement. And so what famously happens in January, 1919 is the Spartacist revolt, which actually recur occurred in response to the dismissal of Berlin's police chief, who is actually a member of the independent and, of course, more radical socialist political party. So it's interesting. Also, uh, we talk a lot about police in the modern United States, but uh, there was a police chief that was, uh, in fact, a, a radical a socialist. So this police chief is dismissed and then protests begin to be called by the newly formed, just recently formed Communist Party of Germany in alliance with a lot of independent socialists. And so hoping to see the energy of these protests, which were much larger than people anticipated, uh, the revolutionary leader Karl Liebknecht calls for a general strike to actually depose Ebert. So you see, again, the left, the divisions between the radical and reformist left playing out with Liebknecht, uh, the leader of the, uh, a leader of the radical left, calling for the deposition of Friedrich Ebert. The, uh, the 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 leader of, of the German government and the leader of the socialist political um, party, the, the the majority socialist political party, and so this I think is is the real moment, Matt, and, and I want to hear you comment on it. But basically, in response, what the Ebert government does is that it uses the recently formed right wing Fry Corps to put down the protests. Uh, hundreds of protesters are arrested, and about 150 people were killed. And most famously today, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, who were leaders of the radical left, were killed. And um, after this, the Ebert government continues to put down other revolutionary movements throughout Germany. So this, I think, January 1919 is the real hinge point. That's the moment when the socialists are like, the majority socialists are like, we're, we're going to ally with the state and we're going to really maintain political power. But was there another way? What what, what could they have done? What could the, the socialists have done or what could the workers' councils have done in order to engender a different sort of thing? I I, I think that I agree that uh, January uh, 1919 is the hinge point. I don't know if there's any alternative to the Berlin uh 
uh, uh, uprising being put down simply because of the lack of coordination. It was uh, not a thing that had been planned for. It was largely a spontaneous reaction, which was true of much of the, the Russian Revolution. Like the, the mass mass actions did not begin, uh, you know, uh, on a planning table. They began in in just the organic response to events but then the party was there to direct events uh and there just simply was not a sufficiently coherent uh, an organized and disciplined uh caught uh force within the uh rebellious uh berlin masses capable of directing the action the the the, the uh, uh, there was this expectation in the first days of of the spartacist uprising that there would be this process of taking over control of uh, crucial city uh, uh, installations, and, and it never happened. There was a lot of milling around, and they kind of just milled around until the Freikorps showed up. Uh, and that was because there was not a sufficient uh, organized principle, because all of the real good organizers, all of your Lenins and stuff, were in the fucking Social Democratic Party. The, 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 the Lenin of 1919 in Germany was at Ebert. Like because the because the the center of gravity of the wor labor of the socialist movement in the country had been sufficiently bourgeoisified that its uh, organizational capacity was captured by the state, uh, and so well I don't think there's any uh, alternative to the Berlin uprising failing. The subsequent uh, domino effect of rebellions that spread throughout the country. You have the Bavarian uh, uh, Soviet that emerges. You have, after the cap push, you have the Ruhr, Val the Ruhr uprising. The capacity existed, and the, mo the motivation and the organization at the ground level, I think, existed for, in the aftermath, maybe, of a uh, failed uh, Spartacist rebellion, and in the aftermath of the death of Luxembourg and Liebknecht, I think the historical moment that presents itself is some sort of Maybe Soviet out, Soviet uh, aided uh, coordination of efforts instead of what you saw, which is uh, just a, a, the spontaneous the spontaneity of the Berlin uprising repeated over and over again, and then in getting specific, cut down. Yeah, in, in the in, same in, exact in way. Pieces, yeah. The in in geographically, and then I mean, part of that is a is frankly a. Uh, a uh, artifact of the fact that Germany had only been a fucking country for 50 years at that point. Like the, there still is a very distinct regional uh, uh, or uh, social reality in, in Germany at that point. To the degree that there are actually different royal houses yeah. that are overthrown yes, during these yes, late 1980s. Yeah. The Whittles box go down. Famously. And that was, that was actually a big shock. A lot of people thought that maybe the Hohenzollerns would go down, but the Whittles box, because they were so popular. But once they go down, it creates a, a whole new reality for these people. But I think the, the question that you're raising is really interesting because the, the, what does it suggest then? What, what would have been possible? A sort of counter guerrilla movement, you know, allied with the Soviet Union? with the Soviets shipping them arms as the Soviet itself is, the, the Union itself is undergoing a civil war as, you know, the allies soon after the war uh, go over. It raises really interesting questions about social organization. And then are we in some sense suggesting that it was always impossible, that there was never going to be a way for these workers' councils to meaningfully enact um, a, a, political, a political power, essentially, to meaningfully enact governance on a large scale at the level of the nation state? Was parliament, should they have pursued to parliamentary strategy well I, I think at that point the par parliament like the democracy that was emerging out of the the fall of the the kaiser uh was definitionally counter-revolutionary and and as the creation and then uh utilization of the freikorps showed was fully devoted to german militarism in its most savage form like uh, there was no hesitation by Ebert and Noska to to take the most traumatized, uh, <laughs> murder addicted uh, victims of the of the first of the war and then just set them loose uh, on their own people who serve as inspiration to the Nazis. Very much so. And in many cases, the, early, the first the first converts to the Nazi party. Uh, I think that what was lacking uh, was, if not a parliamentary arm, uh, an arm uh, that would have mimicked a parliamentary f uh, f arms organizational capacity because uh, all of the organizational capacity of the left had been captured. So the, all was left was the grassroots. And the grassroots will get you uh, the, the spark, but it cannot pers pr pursue uh, a, a coordinated conflict with capitalism because by definition it requires coordination. And that coordination within the working 
the socialist movement in Germany had essentially been been vacated. It had been bought off and 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 bourgeoisified, and uh, and I guess that does suggest that unless you see a, a significant number of like personnel changes and and uh, and twists of contingency uh, domino off of one another, uh, it's hard to imagine. But the thing that makes it so enticing as a historical uh, alternative is that the I, I do believe that the sustained and uh, effective resistance that you saw throughout Germany, uncoordinated, and the way that it sparked genuinely spontaneous yeah. elsewhere, like you had you had a, a Soviet uh, a short-lived Soviet in Hungary. <clears throat> uh, George Lukács, I believe, was a commissar of culture uh, during that short-lived Soviet. <laughs> so, like the and, and there's a civil war in Finland at the same time. I, the, the 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 energies are all there. What is lacking is the coordination, and that does make you think that if I don't know what's specific, it's not like a uh, you know like Lincoln isn't assassinated or or like the, Lenin's train gets derailed on the way to the Finland station. There isn't that sort of. Or Churchill oh. gets run over by a car, the yeah. famous one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there isn't that hinge point that you can point to, but uh, there is certainly a, a collection of forces existing to push the moment of crisis to a real conflict with capital, and that if that happens, the outcome. Uh, really opens up. The historical possibilities open up. What I think the, the the real other hinge point would have been if Ebert and Noska didn't align with the state. But they, that was not going to happen. So that was overdetermined. determined. I think that the, the, that the so party, then it's the bourgeoisification the, of the party. Yes, then, then this yes. is something that we always have to be afraid of then. Because then we're saying that it's overdetermined in the sense that once the party gets those structures that creates this class of the Dick and Bonson, the fat cats, yeah. that they're going to ally with capital. And then also what happened over the course of the war. like the, the, the uh, Ebert moved closer and closer to collaboration with the, the, uh, the non-socialist um, parties and in the state itself over the course of the war. He started collaborating in... in in uh, the Reichstag, much more with the center party. Uh, uh, and then he was the one who initiated the purging of the party in 1917. Uh, and that meant that But when the time came, when the crisis came, he was, him or anyone who had arisen to that position, given those incentives, was going to view the revolution as uh, an existential threat to themselves, to their position, to everything they were, uh, they imagined, the project that they imagined themselves to be in, which might have, in the recesses of their mind, really been a convinced belief that we were going to, that they were going to get to a parliamentary uh, reformist socialism that was going to overthrow capitalism. And the thing that makes me more than ever convinced of the material determining this more than anybody's beliefs in anything uh, is that how anyone could have gone through world war one and at the come out the other end convinced that uh that 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 wasn't the moment that this was because uh marxism really did have that early christian millenniary oh, absolutely, notion that, yeah like this is not a, this is not the long-term battle this is not an eternal it's gonna war. happen in his lifetime it's going thought, to happen yeah. in his lifetime just like jesus said that yeah uh, and like you need that in order to be a motivated revolutionary, just like you needed that to be a motivated Christian in those early days. Uh, and if World War One wasn't enough to convince you that the millennium had arrived, uh, then you were you were too well fed to hear the call, basically, and that no uh, contingency of history is going to change that. And even if it did individually, you would be neutralized and replaced. There were plenty of other people ready to take that job. Of of, uh, of of signing over the the socialist party to the bourgeois. So, but was there? Do you think there was ever a chance of sort of uh, an alliance between the various uh, Arbeiter Reta throughout Germany, or an alliance with the Soviet Union? <clears throat> because the the question then becomes: Is it just impossible for these sorts of things to take on state power? I mean, that's what the history of the twentieth century suggests, and that's why today, I mean, I think revolutionary. Um, Revolutionary revolutionary ideology is essentially just cosplay, but at the at the time, I just wonder in sort of the maelstrom of the end of World War One, if there if they were able to, you know, this the Soviet of of, of Munich or whatever uh, aligns with these various other workers' councils, but before Nazca is able to march in with the Freikorps and the representatives of the state, or was it doomed from the beginning? And then, in some sense, I mean, then we're saying that socialism never really had a chance. 
you know, that it didn't really have a chance against organized state power once it once it begins a reform or any sort of reformist political party, which it almost, I would say, necessarily was going to have to do given the conditions of late 19th century Europe. I would say the thing that could have done it was not going to be any uh, initiative amongst the the different uh, workers' movements because of the very just the fundamental problem of that, the problem of coordination at that level. Uh, it would have been an earlier cap push, maybe. Because uh, the last, like, real and the last, in, in many ways, the most savage of the uh, of the Civil War of the of the German revolutionary uh, conflicts was in the Ruhr Valley after the Cap Putsch. Right. Why don't you explain what the Cap Putsch was and and what happened? Because I think this is also a, a critical moment because this is often pointed to by the socialists later in the 1920s and early 1930s as what could actually be done within sort of the confines of of parliamentary democracy. Yeah. General strike stuff. Right. So the cap putsch occurred, I can't remember the time, in... I think it's March 1920. March 20. March, yeah. March, and so after, the, by this point, the, the Berlin workers had been dispersed. Uh, the, obviously, the Kiel uh, uh, Marines had been dispersed. The Bavarian Social uh, Soviet had been uh, suppressed. Friedrich is head of the government uh, officially after August 1919. The, the, free, the Freikorps is a well-established and, uh, and at the command of the, the Social Democrat-led government uh, when a <laughs> uh, general... Cap uh, stages with the aid of uh, a few of the Freikorps leaders an attempt to seize power in Berlin. Uh, and the Social Democratic government flees in the face of this, stunned that their erstwhile military allies would turn on them. It's like, well, how what? dare they? We, we, we're the ones who put down the workers for you. There's no gratitude, which is the real lesson of all of this. Of course, there's no fucking gratitude. They're, they know that they're in a war with you, and you forgot that. And that's something I would I want to explore, just like why it seems impossible for socialists throughout the North Atlantic history to recognize that fundamental reality of politics, that you have enemies and that you cannot ally with their enemies because they they will destroy you the first second they are able to. I, I think it boils down to the fact that what is what sheep what is supposed to keep you sharp and aware of your enemies is your experience of exploitation. And the leaders of parliamentary socialist parties do not have that. Right. They do not feel exploited. In fact, they <laughs> they're have the PMC. <laughs> privileged positions within a society. They get to have bourgeois lives without feeling guilty about it, as we talked about last time. So uh, I gotta love it, though. So, so in those moments, the the the, the when the, when the when it comes to the real quick, the real conflict, when it's you might be risking imprisonment, death, uh, or you win, and then you have to build something new. Oh my God, that's even scarier than dying. Uh, the 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 lure of the idea that well, you know, we'll get them next time. <laughs> we'll we'll pass a few uh, bills to limit the workday, and we'll increase social insurance, and then in ten years they'll vote us in, and we'll just abolish capitalism with a bill, and they'll they'll go they'll go away. They'll right. say you, you got us. I wonder to what degree they they even believe that because that's so absurd. It just must be a lot of it the continuation it's, of privileges, it's self motivated. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I mean self motivated it, reasoning. It, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's and that's always going to dominate. Uh, and like the vision of Marxism is that the self interest. Gets your uh, your calculus of self interest is expanded to include a class perspective, and that while you may have that, it is dissolved by encounter with that lifestyle. Really, the literal lifestyle of being a a uh, Dickin Bonson. a Dickin Bonson. So they flee. Cap uh, attempts to rule uh, in Berlin, and the Berlin workers uh, stage a general strike, which starts to uh, extend throughout all of Germany, including in the industrial Ruhr Valley. And the Ruhr is important because uh, it's in the southwest of Germany. It's a heart. It's the heartland of German industrial society, and I believe it's technically governed by the French yes. at this point, yes. which is really critical. So, in the Treaty of Versailles, France is given essentially administrative control of the Ruhr, and there's actually like sort of counter guerrilla war i mean there's guerrilla warfare happening i believe in the Ruhr. a recent book came out about that and so it's it's a really like sort of important area it's where the german war machine is made yes and that's and it has a huge huge number of uh, industrial laborers uh, who are uh, organized uh, against the, this reaction which they now see as uh, endangering their rev the their uh, the progress that has been made and not only do they go on strike in the Ruhr, they form military units, these red battalions. And then uh, thanks to the general strike and the general refusal of the bureaucracy to cooperate with COP, uh, they, Cap also flees uh, Berlin <laughs> and says, ah, never mind. Uh, and the, the uh, putsch collapses. 
but in the and and that and so the Berlin workers stand out, but in the Ruhr, the workers decide that that's the last. That's the last. If they're going to do it anyway, if they're going to coup us any, if they're going to send the military in anyway, after all of this, then then this is the last fight. And and what you see throughout this period, and the reason you it's it is so frustratingly periodized in the areas is because what is occurring is in specific areas, people get right. to collectively the realization that this is the moment. Right. But uh, at different moments. Yes. And the thing is that by uh, 1920 and by the Cap Putsch, the Ruhr is the last place essentially to r- r- uh, uprise. Everyone else has had their uprising and had their leftist movement crushed, had the Freikorps come in, massacre the leaders, disperse the movement, throw people in jail. Uh, and so once, uh, that means that when the Ruhr rises, it rises alone. The Freikorps is sent in and they massacre the, the, the workers of the Ruhr. Uh, there's b- just horrifying stories of, of Freikorps massacring like Red Cross nurses and stuff. And this is where you see like the real blood frenzy take over. Uh, and you see how in the absence of a dream of a class project to overthrow capitalism, all that's left is like this individual, uh, a death drive rage that then almost, gets to yeah. be formalized into an, the anti-politics of fascism. Right, uh, right. And this is really critical. I just want to uh, highlight that. I think when you have this republic started on this insanely violent, insanely shaky uh, way, it, it, it doesn't, I don't think it overdetermined that lots of things have to happen for the Nazis to come to power, but it's not a great thing. No. It, it doesn't set things <laughs> doesn't going on, on, a, on a good path, like from the very, uh, very beginning. And this is really problematic again, because you have to remember Germany is supposed to be the place where the revolution yes. happens. Germany is the place upon which socialist and eventually communist transformation is supposed to rest. So there's this one to two year period where it's, things are really in flux and it's the closing off of that possibility um, with the, 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 the end of the Ruhr uprising with the various uh, putting downs of the uprising in Berlin and elsewhere throughout Germany that essentially ensures in some real sense that it's going to be capitalism. Yes. Uh, I mean, it guarantees that the working class will never be able to uh, to uh, cohere again because you now have uh, the Social Democratic Party, which put down the revolution and then emerging from this, the Communist Party, uh, which will very... Uh, reasonably never be able to trust the Social Democrats ever again. Right. I mean, much of the, fascists, of the failure yeah. of the communists to see the threat of the uh, of the fascists and ally with the Social Democrats. Uh, of course, the sem- Social Democrats were similarly uh, opposed to any alliance with the communists, but it's hard to imagine after that just bloody charnel house of that, that crucible period that ever happening. And it's also a betrayal. I, I think it's important to appreciate that these were people who were in the same political party with each other for yeah. years, for decades and sometimes. And so it's so the type of brotherly betrayal, sisterly betrayal that occurs between 1918 and 1920 is really something that lasts throughout the remainder of the Republic. And so you get things like that at some points, the communists aligning with the Nazis or, you know, the, the famous phrase of social fascism instead of social democracy, uh, which was um, um, uh, uh, put by the, by the communists against the social Democrats, and it's because of this early experience in the Republic where the leading socialists really did use the reactionary right wing to put down left wing radical rebellions. So that is why, if I'm going to imagine an alternative, a a a, a, his, a, a counterfactual history that, if not leads to a uh, socialist victory in Germany, at least allows for a real civil war rather than the this this series of uprisings that all eventually fell out. It would be some sort of of military grasp for power sometime in 1919. Uh, something that would have the effect of universalizing throughout Germany that moment of awareness that, oh, because uh, it, it, it is this slow disillusioning over time among the more radical working classes as as their understanding of what their leadership is differs eventually from what they're seeing manifested around them until they get to a point of, uh, realizing, oh, like they're never going to, uh, they're not going to allow us to vote our way into power. And this raises a really interesting question because I once heard someone describe Germany as a, as a country of Milwaukee's, yes. which, which means there's a lot of different power centers in different areas of the country, unlike in, in Russia where it's Moscow. Yeah, there's seven, there are yeah. million mid sized cities. Yeah, there's in, like in eight Germany. or like yeah. Hamburg, Munich, Berlin, Frankfurt, Frankfurt yeah. right? Blah, 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 blah. And I think that that also the particular composition of German industrial society also leads to that sort of That's different true. sorts there's of no moments. There's no Paris to just 
flood there's into. No there's, there's no, no Moscow. There's no Paris. There's, there's no Peter London, Spurs. right? Yeah. Which, which is where every... And I think that is also one of the things where you could say that the failure of socialism was overdetermined into just the peculiar construction of a, of a country of Milwaukee. Yeah. So let's... So if we're going to imagine it, which I think we want to do because it's fun, uh, if there's some sort of uh, right wing military seize, attempt to seize power in 1919 that sets off a more coordinated, if only because they're being motivated by a similar event. A singular event. A singular event that they can mobilize around and not have to worry about coordinating at a level that's impractical from from those sort of uh, grassroots organizations. Uh, the capacity, I think, existed to turn the revolution into a generalized conflict. What happens then, of course, is an entirely different question. And that is where you get into, you know, the dreamscape, where you imagine the right. dominoes falling. But I don't think it's too wild to do that because when you look at the Tinder in post World War One Europe, because we had seen the horrifying monstrosity of the war, and it had totally delegitimized all the governments, uh, and it had um, uh, led to this uh, traumatizing of this whole generation of young men who now have military experience, most of them from the working class, many of them ready to listen to uh, socialist arguments after having seen the nationalist pieties uh, that they had believed in just trampled into mud and experienced this form of socialism in the trenches exactly you know in a real way it had lived experience of socialism and when you when you combine the civil war in finland uh the uh the hungarian soviet uh the uh the mutinies in the french army in 1917 the inverness mutiny that shortly after the war in england if germany goes if, even, if, even if it doesn't go socialist, if it is able to establish a, a provisional socialist government in opposition to a uh, German uh, uh, capitalist government like in Spain, say, uh, or, in, or in Russia at this point, which is still in a civil war, uh, I think the pressure from the uh, other uh, powers of Europe to intervene would be uh, absolutely undeniable. But resistance exactly from... The people who would be asked to fight that war Again. would be absolutely, uh, potentially cat just a cataclysm. And instead what happens is you get the black and tans being sent to Ireland yep. and things like that. You yep. get sort of the the, the yep. escape valve of all of these things. You get the the invasion of Russia, yeah. you know, the, the invasion of the new Soviet Union, rather. And I think that that's also a really interesting thing to see if, if you could have a type of keel inspiration on a continent-wide scale. Yes. And I think that that would have to be the dreamscape, essentially, right? That there's this rebellion in Germany, there's a provisional socialist government, the French and the, and the British and the Americans, frankly, decide to crush it. Yeah. Uh, and then there's actual opposition, particularly in France and Britain, uh, yes. from that sort of, now we're going to be redeployed, you yeah. know, seven months later <laughs> to, to fight, crush the socialists. To workers. Yeah. To not, yeah. not the Kaiser. Right, not, not, not the Hun. Not, not the, the Hun. Yeah. The, the workers, like the, the, the self-identified, self-articulated working class. Uh, among uh, working classes that had been in contact with socialist concepts their entire lives. Uh, and the reason I think that I, at the end of the day, I'm still able to invest hope in the human project is that when I look at that possibility, I see all the reasons that it didn't happen and could not have happened in our world. But those to me are largely the result of, uh, of happenstance. They are, they are, Obstacles put by, uh, not by human minds, uh, but by uh, uh, incident. And that, because that's not determined, because that is a, a, uh, a flip of the coin done you know, over and over again uh, every moment of the day, you can imagine a different lay of the land. And with the same people, with the same historical forces at play, uh, a, a, a narrowly different topography of events and, and, and geographies, Things could have been different, I think. Uh, I, and I think that's right. And I think that's something that we're going to uh, return to throughout this uh, podcast. So uh, thanks, Matt. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Yeah. <laughs>